Pat Toomey. Breaking news, though, coverage continues right now. The beat with Ari Melber. All right, Ari. I got the announcement of an announcement of a deal to have a deal to create the process to create a process for the deal. So maybe you can figure out another version of this. I don't know if I could figure it out, but I think you are <laughs> on the right path of the narration of it, which is a lot of complication for what still looks like. Are you keeping it open or not? Uh, we've right. got a lot tonight. And, and what, are you, what is your tip for how to understand what's real as the night goes on and the shutdown looms? I guess the question is, how does the president cave without looking like he's caving? <laughs> right. Uh, that's, that's a fair that's, question. Apparently, that's what they're trying to... No, that's the deal they're trying to design. Can yeah. they create a deal to make him feel like he didn't look like he caved to Ann Coulter and Rush Limbaugh? Yeah. Uh, Chuck Todd will be watching. Thank you, as always. Thank right you. Right now, as I mentioned, the continuing coverage on the beat. We have the Senate floor live. The talks are underway. The idea is to avert a government shutdown that whatever you think of this president... This is now real as we are within six hours of a shutdown tonight that affects Americans and the world. The government will, if nothing else happens, this is one way to say it, shut down at midnight. Now, earlier today, President Trump said this would now be, guess what, quote, he argues a Democratic shutdown that contradicts not only a lot of what independent experts says, it also happens to contradict the president. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not going to blame you for it. The last time you shut it down, it didn't work. I will take the mantle Good. of shutting down. It's totally up to the Democrats as to whether or not we have a shutdown. It's up to the Democrats. So it's really the Democrat shutdown. That's the contrast. The earlier comments only just last week. It's haunting not only President Trump. It's haunting the entire Republican Party, which could own this so-called Trump shutdown. His words. Now... Here's the latest. Moments ago, we had leaders of both parties trying to cut this deal and speaking on the Senate floor. Democrats have offered three proposals to keep the government open, including a proposal offered by Leader McConnell that passed the Senate unanimously only a few days ago. We are willing to continue discussions on those proposals with the leader, the president, the Speaker of the House, and the leader of the House. All five are necessary to get something done. I move to concur in the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to the House Amendment to the Senate Amendment to H.R. <laughs> 695. If you've heard of stacks on stacks on stacks, those are amendments on amendments on amendments, and you're looking at a panel of truly qualified experts to deal with what's going on in America tonight. It is a big night, and I'm going to go to this panel in one moment. But first, I grant 60 seconds of the latest live reporting to a man who has been very busy, my colleague and friend, NBC's Garrett Haig, live on the Hill. Garrett, the latest. Here's what we know, Ari. What we know right now is that there are not 50 votes in the United States Senate for the president's wall or for the deal that was struck in the House to get $5 billion uh, and kick things back over the other side. What we saw here was a tied vote on this uh, uh, parliamentary vote, this procedural vote here, uh, the tie broken by the vice president. And what you now know is we've essentially got a situation where there is a deal to make a deal. We're back where we started a week ago, but the decks are cleared in the Senate. There won't be another test vote. There won't be another procedural vote. There won't be judges brought up. There'll be nothing else discussed or debated in the U.S. Senate except how to keep the government open. All of that said, we are also back where we started this morning, which is Republican leaders do not have a plan. The Republicans who control both houses of Congress, at least till January, and the White House knew that this vote was probably going to fail, but there's no agreement on what the next steps could or should be. We may go back to where we were even two weeks ago, talking about uh, bills that would include $1.6 billion dollars for border security but not a wall maybe that's the way out for the president on this but right now we're six hours from a shutdown and there is no one plan that can get through both houses and get signed by the president uh garrett this is not goodbye but more like good luck because i trust we at msnbc <laughs> will be checking with you throughout the hour and tonight uh, thank you for that that is the very latest so now we know the score I want to bring in Jason Johnson from TheRoot.com, Attorney Maya Wiley, Howard Feynman, a Washington expert and NBC analyst, and General Wesley Clark, a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, uh, who knows Washington and also understands a lot of the foreign policy crises that are a backdrop um, for a White House in chaos. Uh, Jason, there is plenty of blame to go around Washington, but I ask you for your considered judgment as we begin the hour tonight. Are we witnessing the failure of the Congress or the failure of the President tonight? 
uh, we're witnessing the failure of both, Ari. I mean, one, the president does not know how to negotiate in good faith. Uh, he stabbed Mitch McConnell in the back. He stabbed his own party in the back. But this is an example of the sort of consistent failed leadership of Mitch McConnell and, and Paul Ryan. This is a perfect way for Paul Ryan to end his career in Congress. Despite running both houses in the White House, they couldn't get the most basic promise that they made to their constituents done, which is get money for the wall. Forget get money from Mexico for the wall. They couldn't even get the wall paid for themselves. And now they face a situation where Democrats can objectively say to themselves they were never really going to vote for this outside of DACA. But now we just had a midterm election where Republicans try to scare people into wanting the wall by talking about a caravan for six weeks and still lost congressional seats in border states. Democrats have hmm. no reason to negotiate, and the Republicans don't seem to have any plan on how to deal with not having power in six weeks. And then put that context, Howard, against what this is doing to the American economy. The stock market's complex. It's never moved by one thing. But look at this. This would be the top story otherwise. This is the worst week, this Trump chaos week, <clears throat> since the financial crisis 10 years ago. And you have the federal government heading towards more chaos and instability tonight, which cannot help. Well, I think probably if you want to look at it through the lens of the markets and investors, they're of two minds. Uh, for a long time, they ignored, uh, shall we say, the idiosyncrasies of Donald Trump because they like tax cuts and they like deregulation, et cetera, et cetera. But now they're coming up against the fact that Donald Trump may be uniquely unsuited uh, as a character as a negotiator to be president of the United States. I mean, he brings his, his experience, such as it was, in the art of the deal. And if you read the art of the deal, uh, what you're supposed to do, if you're Donald Trump, is get up and walk away. Uh, threaten to blow everything up every minute. So what that's done is taken an already messed up situation in Washington. I mean, we've had shutdowns now for years, and, 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 and turbocharged it. Uh, with a guy who doesn't know how to negotiate politically. He doesn't know how to negotiate with his own party. He doesn't know how to negotiate with the other party. He's all for getting up and leaving the table. The problem is when you're president of the United States, you can't get up and leave the table. Mm. You've got to help run the government, and that's what he's not doing now. Maya, I turn to you for a wider ambit here. We've covered a lot of aspects of this particular historical moment. This is a week where we saw Mike Flynn in court get chewed out and asked if he was treasonous. Roger Stone's testimony in the, in the Congress handed over to Mueller, uh, which obviously has the looks of being a target, if not about to be indicted. Tremendous pressure on Donald Trump as he shakes up the DOJ and tries to have a new attorney general who we learned just last night was privately advising him not how to run the DOJ, but how to run Mueller out of town legally. Uh, and that comes with all of this pressure. And so how much of this do you think is also Donald Trump dealing with a government that for all of his attempts at control and what some critics have called authoritarian styles, potentially illegal control, is more out of his control than ever and the Democrats haven't even taken charge, which they will next month. Well, it is interesting timing uh, because there's so much chaos on so many fronts, as you've pointed out, Ari. And remember that Donald Trump seemed to be favorable to the deal that Mitch McConnell was crafting that did not have money for the border wall. And then when all the things that happened that you've described happened, he also then suddenly said, $5 billion for my wall or bust, and I'm willing to shut down the government and I'll blame you Democrats. So it's a nice distraction. I think that what we really have to focus on here, and I, I, it's, I just want people to understand, 75% of the government will still be functioning. If there's a shutdown, it's about 25%. And the Mueller probe is actually permanently funded. So this does not impact the Mueller probe itself. In fact, even though DOJ will be impacted if there's a shutdown, it will not impact many of the functions Important point. of the Department of Justice. So there is a lot that will still be happening, which also makes it harder for folks to come to the table and debate, but I think it is a very handy distraction. Right, and so, and that goes to something we often cover here, which is not being pulled aside by some of these issues. I mentioned uh, General Wesley Clark is here, and I want to ask him for his views next, but let's take a moment now that we've done the breaking news from the Hill and look at the larger picture on what has been a truly historic and in many ways difficult week for the country. This could feel to many people like the cliffhanger finale of season two of this Trump presidency, but the stakes are, of course, higher than any narrative. So let's go through it. Lawmakers trying to avoid 
this Trump-inflicted shutdown. America's military reeling after the resignation of the defense secretary, who laid out in public his concerns about China and Russia. Thousands of U.S. troops now ordered by tweet effectively to leave the battlefield, which concerns many military leaders and our allies. Adversaries like Vladimir Putin look gleeful at what is obviously a military power vacuum in places where he's projected force like Syria and back home. New reports, Trump already turning on his brand new chief of staff. Stocks on track, as I just mentioned, for the worst December since 1931. That was the Great Depression. The Mueller probe has all of the controversy now that we know Trump's acting attorney general has, according to the Washington Post, disregarded the ethics advice that he should recuse himself and the Supreme Court ruling against Trump on immigrants seeking asylum while Justice Ginsburg got surgery today. And then privately, amidst all this, Donald Trump reportedly in a, quote, tailspin. That is where we are on what is, yes, literally the shortest, perhaps darkest day of the year. With all of that as a backdrop, General Clark, uh, your job for much of your time in public service was to be that kind of individual to presidents, regardless of the party and regardless of the ideology, where you would be an honest broker and you would also carry out their orders to the best of your ability within your law and ethical duties. Uh, how do you view this week, obviously including uh, the foreign policy issues that are now at the fore? Well, I think we're, we should all be sorry to see Jim Mattis leave as the Secretary of Defense. He's an honorable man. He did the right thing. There's so much difference between his views and the president's views, and the president doesn't listen to his views, and apparently, and the president has undercut him, so he can't deal with allies. So uh, Secretary Mattis did the right thing. He left. And he's exactly right. The president, is, he deserves to have someone who shares his views. The problem is, what are his views and why? There's no strategic logic to this business of pulling troops out, to undercutting our allies and cozying up to our adversaries. Well, let's no build on that. Let me, give you, it. let me give you a follow-up question, because you just put your finger on it, General. What are his views, and what is the foundation, the factual military strategic predicate for those views? Because there are a lot of people who, by the way, are in the, the so-called resistance, they don't like Trump, who also are fairly receptive to responsible ways to drawing down troops from certain uh, fields of battle. You've talked about that. It seems where you and, and Mattis may be concerned about the president is not whether he leans in that direction or not, but the fact that he seems to be leaning back and forth and making policy by Twitter without the underlying facts. Well, not only facts, but it, there's no logic to it. So for <laughs> 70 years, America's security has been maintained by having strong alliances. We know that that's a, what Mattis might call a force multiplier. It's what lets our economic and diplomatic and legal and military efforts have impact around the world. It helped us win the Cold War, kept us peace, mostly safe afterwards. It's what makes America a great, powerful country. It's not the 330 million Americans. It's not even the men and women in uniform. It's American values and our relationships. Why is the president so against this? I, I got it. In a bar in Queens, you can always have a couple of drinks and find somebody who says, yeah, they're taking advantage of us. And you say, yeah, we ought to pull out, screw them. But that's not what a president should do. What's the strategic logic of this? And there isn't any. What do you and have against why, Queens, General this is the problem. <laughs> He's right. Uh, Howard, you? go ahead. General, right. I want right. to give you a response in the good name of the people of Queens. I want to give you a response. Hey, I, right. I, I love Queens. My wife is from Brooklyn. And so, uh, and, and, and President Trump is from Queens. I was just trying to put it in terms he might get. Yeah. Maybe that's what helped Can him, I, you know, I feel learn you. his foreign policy. I feel you. Right. Howard, you know, this is the way people talk and people get their feelings out. But it's not the way great nations make decisions. No. And Howard, uh, and I want to bring you in difference. on that point. And, and All right. this is where the serious meets with the absurd, and I, no, I want no, you to speak, to speak to both. The All serious right. is what everything the general just said about the logical process. The absurd mm -hmm. is, Howard, we all covered as reporters the fact that Mick Mulvaney, we may have remembered it from the time, and we did our homework and checked yep. it. I'm going to put it up on the screen, that he'd called Trump a terrible human being. Now, Trump yeah. turns on him with that information that was readily available and says, quote, <laughs> Did you know he called me a terrible human being during the campaign? <laughs> Howard, his approach to his own chief of staff appears to echo his approach well, to pulling troops out, which is well, do it first and, and watch TV after. Well, first of all, it, it shows that he really doesn't care who his chief of staff is because he didn't bother to check the guy out before he said, hey, you go ahead and be, you be acting chief of staff. But I think Wes Clark... Uh, or, or you be who, acting wild. Either way, go ahead. Yeah, all right. 
<laughs> Wes Clark has put his finger on something here because you described me very generously as a Washington expert. But in order to understand Donald Trump and his approach to the world, mm. I rely on my time as a student in New York and living in New York. Mm. And what I will say is I think Donald Trump, Trump views the world as, a, as a, an array of mob families uh, where he's the kingpin of one mob and he's got to get to know for self-defense, if not ever, anything other, for no other reason, or to to approach and get inside the bubble of the other uh, mob leaders around the world, and those would be Putin and Erdogan and Xi and all the other dictators that he seems to feel simpatico with, because it's one mob boss talking to another. Forget the government, forget the United Nations, forget the law, forget everything else. It's an extremely crude and jungle-like view of the world as seen through the eyes of mob families. That's how Donald Trump operates, and that is his worldview. If there is a Trump doctrine, it comes from Queens and Brooklyn and from New York and from the mob families that control that city. Yeah, and I, would, I think it's a, an important uh, point you contribute. I would only echo it by saying it comes from the movie depiction of how those things yes. work and not always well, the reality. And well, he dealt, I think he dealt with, look, if you're, if you're going to be in real estate in New York, if you're going to be business in New York, if the regular banks are going to shut you yep. out and not have anything right. to do with you, you got to get your money from somewhere. Yeah. And that can be Russia, that can be somewhere in Istanbul, that can be from somewhere in Kuwait. Right. I feel you on that. Jason, then you have the other side of this story, which is Trump could do what he wants, but right. we are witnessing the beginning of a Pelosi Washington, and it is running different than the way it was under Paul Ryan. Here's Nancy Pelosi standing up to Donald Trump, setting the predicate for what we see tonight, which is obviously a bigger problem politically as well as for the country, but a problem for Trump and the Republicans. Take a look. The president is doing everything that he can to shut the government down. You have to ask the question, why? Does he not believe in governance? Does he not care about the American people? Doesn't he know uh, that the economy is uncertain? Hasn't he followed the stock market that he likes to brag about? Jason? I mean, it, look, it, it, that was a surgical takedown, right? I mean, Nancy Pelosi has been waiting to do this from a position of power for years. But here's the other thing that's really problematic about Trump, the supposed brilliant negotiator, even though no one in their right mind really believed that. I, I mean, he's, he's like a bad supervillain who tells Bond what the plan is beforehand. When you do a press conference last week with Chuck and Nancy and you say, I'm going to tear everything down, I want a government shutdown, everybody knows what your plan is. Everybody yeah. knows where the secret files are. So his, his negotiation negotiating is so poor, whether it's public and whether it's international. I'll also say this, you know, as much as he may consider himself to be a mobster or a gangster, he's basically a halfway crook because he doesn't know what he's doing. He told us we were going to go into Syria and all of our soldiers would bring our oil back. I don't see where that oil is. So I even if you believe that it was a good idea to go in initially because it was going to lower gas prices, he's failed in that as well. Uh, I got to fit in a break because we have so much bre breaking news going on on the Hill. I just want to give some serious credit here to Jason Johnson with the Mob D, <laughs> Howard Feynman with the guy. Godfather, General Clark with Queens, which could be coming to America, and Maya Wiley just for being Maya Wiley. We're going to fit in a break. Thanks to each of you on a busy Friday. Democrats up ahead. They're not